Good morning. Thank you for that response. I appreciate that, that you didn't just ignore. <clears throat> uh, as you're finding your seats, we'll ask the deacons to come on down and uh, begin to take up the offering. Uh, this is for local missions, and uh, we appreciate your involvement in this way. Um, last week, we heard from Dr. Bill Barkley on the church member's role in upholding or in the Lord's Supper, the church member's role in the Lord's Supper. And this morning, we have the privilege uh, of having Dr. Steve Nichols with us, and he will speak to us about the church member's role in upholding the truth. Um, Steve is uh, president of Reformation Bible College, chief academic officer for Ligonier Ministries, and a Ligonier Ministries teaching fellow. He holds a PhD from Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, and he, uh, he's the host of the podcasts Five Minutes in Church History and Open Book. And he's the author of more than 20 books. And I checked with uh, Deborah Kirkland, and I also checked myself. And um, you'll be able to find a time for confidence on the book table in the atrium of Jackson Hall. Time for confidence. Bonhoeffer on the Christian life. The Reformation. And... Reformation ABCs, which is a children's book that Steve has written. All of those are there and available uh, for you. Uh, Steve has been here, uh, as he had said in the early service, he's been here many times before. Uh, he's a friend of this congregation, a wonderful person, and uh, an incredible speaker, and Christian man, and we're just really blessed to have him here with us this morning. Uh, before he comes, let me open in prayer. Father, we are so thankful to have your word. We hear so many lies. There is so much confusion about you who you are and what you're like. Forgive us for the temptation to formulate our opinion of you by our experience and our needs. Help us to run to your word, to study it, to look to your spirit, to lead us into the truth about you. Thank you that as we heard, this is truly where our confidence lies. Where else would we place our confidence without you? We thank you for this opportunity to be challenged and we pray that you would help us to receive the challenge that we get and to look to you to help us love you with all of our hearts and to love your word. And we thank you for it and we thank you for this time and ask you to help Steve now as he comes to speak to us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. David. It is a real pleasure to be here. I do love this church and uh, love this town and you all. It's good to be among friends. And I looked out in the audience uh, and I see actually friends of ours from Augusta, Georgia. So they must like first press Columbia too. Uh, it's a magnet. The only problem uh, with coming here, my 
times of coming here is that I'm usually coming here because Derek's somewhere else and I don't get to see Derek. So if only I could be here and see Derek at the same time, that would just be fantastic. And then I thought to myself, no matter how hard I try, I can never escape Ligonier and R.C., and there we are, as the service ends, singing R.C. Sproul's hymn. So, he's everywhere, no matter how hard we may try. Upholding the truth. I want to think about this in terms of two challenges to upholding the truth. And then I want to think in terms of our response. Uh, the first challenge I would simply call truth decay. Now, I'm sure there's a dentist in this house. This is not tooth decay. Truth decay. There were nine, and, I, and I'll speak to the area I know best, which is higher education. But as I walk you through this, think not only about truth decay in institutions of higher learning that had a theological identity and vision and mission and purpose. But also think of denominations and also think of churches. There were nine colonial colleges. Harvard was founded in 1636. Here's a first-hand account. After God carried us safe to New England and we had built our houses provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government. One of the next things we longed for and looked for and looked after was to advance learning and to perpetuate it to posterity, dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. And as we were thinking and consulting how to effect this great work, it pleased God to stir up the heart of one Mr. Harvard, a godly gentleman, a lover of learning, then living amongst us, to give one half of his estate, it being about 1,700 pounds, towards the erecting of a college, and he gave all his library. After him, another gave 300 pounds, Others then cast in more. I'm a college president. I love this. I could read this all day long. And more and more. And the public hand of the state added the rest. The college was by common consent appointed to be at Cambridge, a very pleasant place, and is called, according to the name of the first founder, Harvard College. Dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches after our present ministers, educated, most of them at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, lie in the dust. The Harvard Laws, published 1700 by Increase Mather, required all graduates to be able to translate from the Hebrew text of the Old Testament and the Greek text of the New Testament into Latin. <laughs> Not English, no, that, that's, we're going to skip over that. All graduates had to translate the Hebrew Bible and the Greek New Testament into Latin. The motto of Harvard was Veritas Pro Christo et Ecclesia. Truth for Christ and for the church. William and Mary was founded in 1693. This is the only southern college I'm going to mention. William and Mary was founded in 1693 in the colony of Virginia. Its charter declares a perpetual college of divinity, philosophy, languages, and other good arts and sciences. It was founded to supply clergy and civil servants to the colony of Virginia. Yale was third. It was founded in 1701. Its charter Whereas several well-disposed and public-spirited persons of their sincere regard to and zeal for upholding and propagating of the Christian Protestant religion by a succession of learned and orthodox men 
have expressed by petition their earnest desires that full liberty and privilege be granted unto certain undertakers for the founding, suitably endowing and ordering a collegiate school within his majesty's colony of Connecticut, wherein youth may be instructed in the arts and sciences, who through the blessing of almighty God may be fitted for public employment, both in the church and in the civil state. University of Pennsylvania, number four, was founded in 1740. Up until 2020, there was a statue of George Whitfield on the campus. The original buildings of Penn were built to accommodate crowds gathered in the streets of Philadelphia to hear Whitfield preach. It's true that Penn's founder, Ben Franklin, intended Penn to be different from the other three colonial colleges up until that time. Franklin was much less interested in a theological curriculum and the training of ministers. But nevertheless, the roots of Penn are in the Great Awakening. Fifth College was started solely as training for clergy. Princeton was founded in 1746. The roots of Princeton stretch back to the late 1720s and the founding of Log College in Neshaminy, Pennsylvania. And then they crossed over the Delaware River and went to Princeton. It was founded by William Tennant. Tennant died in 1745, and in that next year, the Log College faculty became the trustees and the faculty of Princeton. The first presidents were all clergymen, including Jonathan Dickinson, Aaron Burr Sr., the son-in-law of Jonathan Edwards. Number three was Jonathan Edwards, Samuel Davies, Samuel Finley, and John Witherspoon, a Scot and the only clergy to sign the Declaration of Independence. The role of early Princeton and Princeton Seminary, which was founded in 1812, is legendary. The Anglicans have a college in the North too, King's College, or as it's known now, Columbia University. It was founded in 1754 by Samuel Johnson, former rector of Yale, former congregational minister turned Anglican. Can't leave out our Baptist friends. Brown University was the result of a group of Baptist ministers meeting in Philadelphia to determine a place in New England for their college. So of course they're going to go to Rhode Island and Rhode Island welcomed them and Brown University opened in 1764 with the explicit purpose of training ministers for Baptist churches. And let's not forget our Dutch Reformed Church friends. Is Godfrey coming this summer? Or no, he was here, wasn't he, for your 225 plus two? Is that right? Well, in honor of our good friend, Dr. Robert Godfrey, the Dutch Reformed Church had their college too. Rutgers. Rutgers was the eighth colonial college founded in 1766. Very first class was taught by Frederick Feelingheisen, the grandson of Theodore Freelingheisen, who was a prominent figure in the Great Awakening. The Freelingheisens were ministers all. The impetus behind Rutgers was the need for the Dutch Reformed Church to have their own college to train their own ministers. And now we come to the ninth colonial college. It's my favorite story. Eliezer Wheelock he was a minister in Lebanon, Connecticut. He was present when Jonathan Edwards preached sinners in the hands of an angry God in Enfield. He wrote a letter about it back to his congregation, and it is one of three first-hand accounts of the preaching of that sermon at Enfield, Connecticut that Eliezer Wheelock, minister and armchair church historian, preserved for us. In the end of the Great Awakening, Samson Ockham was a Mohegan Indian who came to Wheelock and requested to be tutored for the ministry. Ockham went on to be a rather significant colonial figure. Out of that tutelage, Wheelock opened a school for other Native Americans in Lebanon, Connecticut. 
Ockham volunteered to go on a campaign to Old England to raise money for the school. Since Connecticut already had a college, Wheelock went to New Hampshire. He opened a school to train Native Americans or First Peoples in theology and to train ministers who would especially serve as missionaries. The original motto of Wheelock's college was Vox Clementis in Deserto, a voice crying in the wilderness. Wheelock named the college Dartmouth after the Earl of Dar Dartmouth, who was not a benefactor, but Wheelock hoped he would become a benefactor, <laughs> but it didn't work. But it's still, still a cool name, Dartmouth. Nine colonial colleges, with the exception of one, Penn, all were founded to train clergy, not exclusively, but distinctly, and all taught theology. Theology was the queen of the sciences in the academy for centuries. And in these early colonial colleges, it was at the very heart of the curriculum. Do I even have to say the ergo to this to you? There is a disease called truth decay. I don't know why. It's hard to keep a good thing going. Well, we know why. It's a sin-wrecked world, isn't it? But how do we uphold the truth when honest evaluations of history tell us the tides are against us? So I told you there were two challenges. One is truth decay. The second, we might say, is this cultural craziness of the death of truth. It was back in 1964 that a French Canadian, Jean-Francois Lyotard, wrote a book on postmodernism. The Postmodern Condition, he titled it. And in there, somewhere around page 30, is this line, I define postmodernism as, big words are coming, are you ready? Incredulity towards meta-narratives. Now, let's work through each one of those words. Towards, we got that. Incredulity, uh, likely one of my favorite Elvis songs, we can't go on like this with suspicious minds. What Leotard is saying is that the postmodern condition is suspicious minds. Incredulity. That just sounds too good to be true. That just sounds a little bit too much. Incredulity. Suspicion. Meta narratives. We know what a narrative is it's a story. Not just a story to entertain, but a story that gives meaning to something. Like what is the story of the nine colonial colleges? That's giving meaning to something. What is meta? Meta is, is above, right? Overarching. So a meta narrative is a grand story, an overarching story. You might even say the story that makes sense of everything, that explains everything, that shows where everything fits and how everything fits and they don't exist. Postmodernism is at its core a suspicion that there is a grand story. Another postmodern philosopher, Richard Rorty, taught at NYU, finished his career in Virginia, 
at UVA said, we need to stop looking for sky hooks. Sky hooks are things that are above us, meta, beyond us, trans, that give meaning, that give us that, that place to hold on to. Rorty says we need to stop looking for sky hooks because they don't exist. All we have are toe holds. So all of a sudden, we moved from truth, being capital T, singular, in an absolute sense, that certainly you apply this in any field. You apply this in the field of medicine. You can apply this to the field of law. You can apply this to the field of literature, where all this craziness began in the literature departments. And the idea is, there is truth. We'll learn it, we'll debate it, we'll argue it, we'll seek it, but there's a needle in that haystack and it exists. And I'm thankful that every time I hop on that Delta plane, that there are truths and that my pilot's not postmodern. <laughs> He's not suspicious about these laws that govern the universe. Went from truth to truths, small t, plural, toe holds. That's, that's the first generation of postmodernism. The second generation is, why are we even talking about truth at all? And so, in this world of post, postmodern, uh, post geography, post binary gender, post truth, post truth. It's probably one of the one of those expressions. It's like fingernails on the chalkboard for me. My truth. Your, what's your truth? Find your truth. I, I hope these people never end up in a court of law. Thank you. We theologians don't have many jokes, so thanks. It's like one. Truth decay, death of truth. This is the world in which we live. That's the challenge. Now, how do we respond? Well, let's look to God's word. When does this end? Ten of. Okay. Thank you. I don't, I want to make sure the 11 o'clock preacher has enough time. First <laughs> uh, Timothy chapter two. I'm sorry, three. First Timothy three. <clears throat> 14 to the end of that chapter, 14 to 16. So we, so we know the challenge. Uh, the challenge is uh, there's apostasy. Uh, there's, we see it in institutions of theological higher education. We see, it in, in, we see it in institutions even not of higher theological education. We see it in Christian schools, uh, K to 12 schools. We see it in denominations. We see it in churches. We see it in Christians and individuals, there is apostasy, there is the drifting away. You know what apostasy means? Apostasia, the Greek word. If you're going to go on some Greek ship, on a Greek boat, you'll go down to the dock and you'll see apostasia, three o'clock. The ship departs at three o'clock. Apostasia just means a departure. So we have truth decay and we have a culture telling us there's no such thing as truth. The death of truth. So how do we respond to all this? So there's always these intimate moments in Paul's epistles to his beloved Timothy, aren't there? I, I hope to come to you, singular. I hope to come to you, Timothy, soon. But I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, if I'm, if I'm kept from seeing you, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. If I were Timothy, I'd be paying attention right now. 
And then we have here uh, a clause that the hermeneutics people tell us is ep-exegetical. That means it, it, it defines for us the words just prior to it. The household of God. Now Paul's going to explain what the household of God is, which is the church of the living God. This is one thing that the, the, this household of God is. It's one thing that the church is. It's the household of God. It is the church of the living God. And then one more exegetical clause. The church is a pillar. I don't know if any of you have been to, to London. If you've been to London and you've been to the elephant and castle section of London, you know that there stands the Metropolitan Tabernacle, the great church that was built for Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And there's a particular uh, stairs up out of the underground that if you come out at the right spot, so there's four or five ways to exit out there onto different streets. But if you come out at the right spot, the very first thing you'll see as you emerge from the steps are the pillars of Metropolitan Tabernacle. And during the bombing of Britain, the church was leveled by a bomb, but the pillars stood. You can imagine the sight of the rubble and the destruction. But what a symbol that the pillars stood. We, we know what a pillar is, right? It's an architectural support, but it also makes a statement. It speaks of strength. It speaks of solidity. It speaks of the world may shake and quake and fall, but this Structure will stand. That's a pillar. Built by engineers. Based on physics, which is truth. And a buttress. Uh, we know this because we like Luther. And we like this idea of a Support, a buttress to our faith. A pillar and a buttress of what? Of truth. So this is the definition of the church. The church is the household of God. It is the church, the ecclesia, the gathered people of the holy God. And it is the pillar of and buttress of truth. So this was true of the first century, and it is true of the 21st century. So here's the response. The response is that we need to stand for truth. In the midst of truth decay and the challenge that the truth is dead, we need to say, no, it isn't. And then look at what happens next. This is very fascinating. Two things happen next. Paul turns to Timothy to give what many theologians believe is one of the earliest confessions. We'll recite here in a little bit, or we did, the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed was sourced in what we call the bishops' creeds. And these were bishops of different regions of the church that had succinct statements of faith that were summative declarations of the Christian belief. And if you wanted to be a member of the church, you would recite this bishop's creed showing that you were signing up for this group that was defined by beliefs. And they were usually written in a way that were memorable, with, with rhythm and, and with some structure to the line so that you could memorize it. So it would become part of your mental furniture so there was actually a teaching tool for you. And all of those elements of the, of the Apostles' Creed are gateways into rich terrains of theology. 
Well, they used bishop creeds, as you can imagine, had similar phrases, and eventually they were brought together, and in the fifth century or so, we have this form that's emerged, sixth century, that we call the Apostles' Creed. But many believe that verse 16 is an early creed that was either circulating in the church or that Paul gives to the church in this text. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is there's a rhythm to it. There's a, there's a meter, actually, to the phraseology that's there. You pick it up a little bit in the English translation, but it's certainly there in the Greek rhythm. And it's introduced with this idea. We confess. We say this together. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. And then what do we have? We have a summative statement of Christ capturing his incarnate life. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. Incarnation to ascension. At the center of the church is the truth of Jesus Christ. What is this pillar and ground of truth? What is this truth? It's a statement. It's a declaration of the person and work of Jesus Christ. That is the center piece truth of the church that we must guard and protect and proclaim and declare to the nations. But then look at what happens in verses one and following of chapter four. It's very interesting. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will what? Apostatize. That's the word, apostasia. Some will apostatize. They'll depart from the faith. By what? By believing lies. By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits. There's the lies. And not a body of teaching that is the truth that is handed down by God and given to the apostles and prophets and then to the people of God. No, by a body of teachings from Satan himself, lies straight from the pit of hell, smelling like smoke. So here's the challenge, Timothy. Here's how you behave in this household of God, the truth versus the lie. Orthodoxy versus heresy. He continues... Through the insincerity, you know what insincerity is. It's, it's, it's not true to its very core and being. It's not true to itself. It's untrue. The insincerity of liars who don't even know they're lying. Their consciences are seared. And then, I'm intrigued what comes next. Demon teaching, insincere liars, what comes next? They forbid marriage, and they require abstinence from foods. I'm expecting like child sacrifice, I don't know. It seems a little anticlimactic that the teaching of demons has to do with, you know, not having a bagel or something, like the choice of foods. I know it's other things too, but. And what what does Paul say? God created all of this. Created marriage. Created food. Uh, You go back to the creation account. and, And we're told not just that we were given plants and, and this creation that was good for food, but also what? Pleasing to the eye. A God made a material universe that we are to enjoy. And the lie here, the deceit here, the twisting here is that creation and matter is bad. And so to be a true Christian, you have to avoid all that. And the reason that's the lie here is because the worldview that dominated the first century was Plato and Platonism. And Plato had a very basic, lot good in Plato, there's no doubt. 
But there's a basic doctrine of Plato's that's bad, and it is this. Matter is bad. Material is by definition evil. That's why they deny that Jesus came in the flesh. That's where Arianism uh, comes from. <coughs> Sorry. Matter is bad. So there's a worldview that is a lie that has overtaken culture and has infiltrated the church. And Paul says to Timothy, the church has an obligation here. You have an obligation to teach people how to behave. And what will Paul say often? Watch your doctrine, watch your life. Guard your doctrine, guard your life. Guard your doctrine, Timothy. Christology. Never assume they know it. <laughs> teach it all day long. But also, watch your practices. And watch how the lies will come in. Right? And notice this. I lo this is very fascinating to me. This is why sometimes chapter divisions are a little bit unhelpful. We got to keep the thought going. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. I'm telling you this so you know how to behave. We've got to keep that thought going. So what do we do? We're the opposite of the, of the liars and the deceived. We don't uh, forbid marriage. We don't uh, abstain from foods. No, we know the truth. God created. And he created these things to be received with thanksgiving. So when your kid asks you, why do we pray before meals? Well, there it is. We receive these things with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Isn't that great? For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. What Paul is saying here is there's a destructive influence in culture, Timothy. And that destructive influence has crept into the church, Timothy. And you need to help people know how to behave. And it's by upholding the truth. And, and we sometimes think about truth in terms of theology, and we must. We must. I work for Ligonier Ministries. We do three things at Ligonier Ministries. Theology, theology, theology. So, I knew, see, there's joke number two. So, I, I, I believe that. We think about truth, we think about theology, but we think about truth, we also have to think about the worldviews and their destructive influences that make their way into lifestyles and life choices. And the issues we don't have in the 21st century are the forbidding of marriage. We have the sanctity of marriage is the truth. And so what do we say to the teachings of demons and the lies that marriage is unnecessary? Or back to 2015 in Obergefell, redefining marriage as not between a man and a woman. Supreme Court of the United States redefining marriage what do we say? God created male and female. And God created the woman for the man. We say the same thing. We go back to the same place. The truth of God's word declared in his word and also declared in his world. We do the same thing. And we do it because... There's the air raid. And there's the rubble. And in the midst of the rubble and the ruin and the confusion and the chaos, there are the pillars. A symbol. A very real symbol. But there is truth in this wasteland of post-truth. Well... <clears throat> I think we can see this pointed directly at us if we go to the end of Paul's epistle to Timothy. 
chapter 6, verse 20. Can, can you hear it in Paul's voice, the tenderness? Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Uh, the early church called this the depositum fide, the deposit of truth. A deposit is, is an inheritance. You know, think of your relative and they may know their time on earth is soon and they have this precious thing. Maybe it's a watch that your father was given by his father and now he's, he's trusting it to you. Uh, maybe it's a picture, a wedding picture, a picture of a grandparent. Just think of this precious thing. And, it, and it's preserved. It's been kept in a treasure box, maybe even kept in a safe. It's been, it's been guarded. It's been protected. It's been taken care of. Moves upon moves. Things have been lost, but not this. And, and they call you in and they say, I want you to have this. And now it's yours. Now what do you do? You guard it, protect it, keep it, and move upon move upon move. No, this will stay. It will be passed on. That's what a deposit is. And so we have this deposit, don't we? It's the most precious deposit of all. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we can never take it for granted because there is apostasy. It really is there. You know, I, I, I think about this. Uh, when you read the New Testament epistles, when you talk about apostasy in the early church, I mean the pages of the New Testament church, these are churches founded by the apostles. Galatia, with all of its problems, as Paul tells, not marginal, not tangential, not tertiary, core, center, primary, truth. It's a church Paul helped found. That's a church Paul himself preached in. And within months, years, apostasia st stepped in. So, so when you think about this, now you know what guarding that deposit means. And, it, and it's very interesting, isn't it, too, what follows? Avoid the irreverent babble and the contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. O oh, Timothy, a huge threat to you and to the church and to the people of God you serve is lies. A huge threat is falsehood. A huge threat is that which is not truth. So I was talking to David. I've learned that half of the elders and pastors here are called David. <laughs> so if I'm unsure, I'm just going to say David. This is look into a crowd and say, David, I think I'll get it right. That David. I thanked him for um, this topic. I mean, this, this is right over the plate, upholding the truth. You guys treated me very well by giving me this. Very grateful for it. And we're thinking about this, as I understand your series, you're thinking about this in terms of for the church. What is it that is incumbent upon the people of the church to do? And you all defy the laws of entropy at this church. I don't know. It's by the grace of God. But when I'm talking about apostasy, exhibit A, that it doesn't have to happen, 
is First Presbyterian Church of Columbia, South Carolina. And I don't tell you that to make you arrogant or elitist. I actually tell you that because I hope you feel the weight of that obligation. And it is on the pastors. There's no doubt about it. And, and behind the pastors is the seminaries. And you trace it. As the seminaries go, the pulpits go. When the pulpits go, the churches go. And then... Was it the city of Prague has, I think, most churches of any city in Europe? You won't find a church service there. You'll find concerts all week long meeting in those great churches. A city and a nation, apostasia, four centuries, less than 0.2% of the population, Czech Republic, Christian. So this is an obligation that you all have to uphold the truth. And, and it is on the pastor's shoulders, but it's also on those who sit in the pew. As you talk to your children and your grandchildren, as you take this precious thing and you say, come here, I want to show you something. Here's this precious thing. It's the gospel. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm telling it to you. I'm passing it on to you. Here's this precious thing. Our Savior, manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, taken up into glory. Here it is. This is who Christ is. And there's a whole worldview out there that says all kinds of crazy things, and it's getting crazier. And, and since... Darwin in the mid-1800s, the guns have been named at Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And it, and it first came from the hard sciences, biology and geology. Now it's coming from the soft sciences, the, the, social, the sociologists saying uh, this, this heterosexual marriage, this insistence upon gender, no. Gender is a social construct. We know that now. The guns have been aimed at Genesis 1 to 3 for 150, 200 years. So you say, God created male and female. God created this world. And this world is from him, and by him, and through him, and for him. And you were created for his purposes. That, that's the truth. That's the truth that we must uphold. That's the truth that has been given to the church. And this is what the church does. And we, we stand in the marketplace and you, you sit on two city blocks. Do you, you take up two city blocks? here? You sit on two city blocks and you say, you signal to the world, to thousands upon thousands of college students next door, and you say, this is the truth. This is the truth. And even if the world is crumbling around you, it's your obligation to uphold the truth. Well, let me pray for you, pray for us. Father and our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us your word, and that your word is truth. We thank you for the gift of your church, the invisible body of Christ. And we thank you for the visible bodies of Christ. This household of God, this gathered people of the living God, this pillar and buttress of truth. Give us grace and strength and courage to uphold it. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.